Hello, wonderful people. Good evening to you all. You are warmly welcome to the Wolo Revision Show on Joy Learning. My name is Peter Light Crimson Jr., your English language teacher. And for this evening, we are looking at summary writing. Yes, summary writing. What most of you students would like to refer to as almighty summary. For those that think that summary writing is a challenge, I have a very simple story for you this evening. Sit attentively through the lesson, and I assure you that by the time we are done, you would agree with me that indeed, summary writing is enjoyable and not a challenge at all. Welcome once again, and let's quickly see our lesson objectives for this evening. So yes, we are looking at summary writing. And we expect that by the end of this lesson, the student or you must be able to recognize and distinguish main or relevant points from irrelevant details. That is the first one. You must be able to recognize and distinguish main or relevant points from those that are irrelevant. That is our first objective for the evening. Get that in mind. The second one says that by the time the lesson is over, you must be able to exhibit a sense of economy of words. What does that mean? We are talking summary writing. And we are saying that by the time the lesson ends, you must be able to exhibit a sense of economy of words. Our third lesson objective state that you must be able to present summary answers in the required grammatical form at the end of this lesson, dear students. That's our third lesson for the evening. And then finally, by the time the lesson ends, I believe and trust that you must be able to, you must be able to write answers using your own words you must be able to write your answers using your own words. So those are very simple four objectives for the evening. Let's now see our outline for the discussion. Of course, first, we shall seek to explain what summary writing means. Now, when we see the explanation and you take a critical look at it, you will notice that there is an implication embedded in the explanation that we shall see. We shall see this implication too and see how further that can also guide our study on summary writing. Then of course we move on to see the definition. We shall look at a workable definition that we shall use for our discussion and then move to look at how to summarize. We are talking summary this evening, dear students. So we must look at how to summarize, and we shall get there and talk about or see the kind of things that you can do to make summary writing enjoyable for yourself. Then, of course, we shall take some text or extracts as illustrations and then see the responses that we can potentially give to these illustrations that will come with questions. And then I shall tell you also about some do's and don'ts regarding summary writing. I usually like to refer to them as principles or commandments. But put simply, you can call them do's and don'ts. And at that point as well, I will share with you the kinds of things that you can do to enhance your performance in summary writing. So now the explanation that we spoke about, I'm sure you'll find it on the screen. Any brief, precise, compact, and carefully compressed, dear student, watch those adjectives there carefully. The first one, brief. So your summary answer foremost must be brief. Another adjective, almost a synonym or a synonym too brief, it must be precise. Yet another synonym, it must be compact. I'm sure when we say something is compact, you understand what we're talking about. We shall relate that to summary writing and see the kind of answers 
that we see are compact. And then the last, carefully compressed version or account of an otherwise lengthy text or passage. So dear student, very simply, we are looking at a situation where you have before you a text or a passage, or if you may, an extract of a certain length. Your duty, your job as a student is to make that long or lengthy text short. How do you do that and do it well? That is why we are here this evening. Now, the implication I spoke up to you about. Now, the simple implication in the explanation is that by producing a brief version of a lengthy text or passage, we are expected to present only, dear student, watch that also carefully, only, will my pen write? Yes, I'm sure. Only the main important point in the text. That is what we're talking about. We've seen the explanation. And we are looking at the implication that we find embedded in that explanation. Which implication we say once again is that by producing a brief version of a lengthy text or passage, the expectation is that we present only the main point. So dear student, once again, at this point, my simple question to you is, how do you find and present only the main point? We shall get there and you get to see what we're talking about. Now let's look at our definition as to what summary is. So summary is a short or brief account that states or gives the main point from a text or a passage. It is short and it is brief. How is it short? How is it brief? It is short, it is brief because it presents only the main point. Effectively, that is what summary is. And that is what we are here to learn this evening. Let's now look at how to summarize. To be able to write a good summary, there are certain things that you need to ignore. And I've listed a few here for you. Remember, we are saying that you are looking at a text that is ordinarily long or bulky, if you may. When you are asked to write a summary on such a text, your job is to make it short. We are now learning that you are only able to make it short by presenting only what is useful, what we call the main point, the most important idea that you would find from the text. That is summary. So we are at a point where now we are coming to look at how to find what is most important to present as summary answers. Because indeed, that is what essentially summary writing is about. I'm sure you are with me. That's good. So let's go on. Now we are learning that to be able to write a good summary or present a good summary answer, when you find adjectives and adverbs, my dear student, my dear friend, avoid or ignore them in presenting your summary answers. You know what adjectives are and you know what they do. Similarly, you know what adverbs are. And my dear student, you know what adverbs do. An adjective, very simply, would qualify a noun. And by qualifying a noun, the adjective adds some extra information to the noun, which now is to be seen as what is main. I'm sure you understand my story. You are looking for a shorter version. The shorter version we talk about here is the version that presents only what is most important. So if you are to present what is most important, then it means that from that very text, there are certain elements or items that are not so much useful. So in presenting your answers, 
you do not include these items that we say are not useful when it comes to summary writing. And dear students, the first we are looking at, adjectives and adverbs. Adjectives and adverbs to the extent that, like I said a while ago, they only add some extra information. But think about this. We are looking at the situation where the answer you present must be short. Short because it presents what is most important. And if you are looking to present what is most important, then dear students, the items that add extra information to the main idea or main point, which has already been presented, must be discarded or thrown away. I believe you understand that story, dear students. It is the same for the adverb. I'm sure you know what an adverb is. And you know what an adverb does. Again, presenting circumstantial information or some modification of a verbal item. So to the extent that you are looking for precision, you are looking for brevity, answers that are short, precise, and straight to the point. Grammatical items that qualify by adding extra information must never be part when presenting summary answers. And I'm sure you understand that one. Let's see the next one that you need to ignore in presenting summary answers. And I choose to call them illustrative phrases and clauses. Illustrative phrases and clauses. Dear student, I'm sure you know what a phrase is. And I'm sure you know what a clause is. These that I am calling illustrative here are mostly adjectival phrases and clauses or adverbial phrases and clauses. And my dear student, just like the single word adjective, just like the single word adverb that we spoke about a while ago, by saying that they must be cut off, avoided or discarded when presenting summary answers. It is the same for these phrases and clauses that I call illustrative. And look at the name, illustrative. What does that mean? It can only serve to add extra information once again. So to the extent that, once again, you are looking for precision, these phrases that only add extra information must never be a part of the summary answer that you would supply to whatever summary question that you will find. When we see the illustrations, you'd get to practically see what we talk about over here. Now, another item, dear student, that you must consciously cut off from your summary answers Explanation of main points. That's very simple. This is the situation, dear student, where you would read the text, you read the passage or the paragraph, and then notice that the main point has been presented somewhere in the paragraph. The writer probably would want to make the point clear or for emphasis. By doing this, the writer may decide to give examples or explanations to the main point that has already been given or stated. And what I share with you at this time or at this point is that in presenting your summary answers, cut off explanations. Because these explanations only come to explain the main point which has already been stated. And again, because you are looking for precision, accuracy, and brevity, you don't include explanations in summary answers. Again, we shall practically see how that works. And then again, dear student, what you find next, examples, that's a very simple one. Do not ever write summary answers and include examples. Very much unacceptable to find that you include or you list examples in your summary answer. It's almost an abomination. Do not ever do that. And then finally, 
do not include repetitions in your summary answers. Another abomination when it comes to summary, dear students. I believe we know what repetitions are used for, be it in speech or in writing. We use repetitions essentially for emphasis. Now, this is the instance or the case where we are looking for precision. We don't, therefore, include repetitions in summary answers. Let me quickly say at this point that these are not the only items that you can do away with before you'd be able to arrive at a good summary answer for that matter. Now let's see illustrations relative to these things that we say we should cut off and then see how we apply what we have learned or studied thus far. Now, even before we see the illustrations, dear students, make summary writing simple for yourself. Every time, make it simple. And you can always make it simple for yourself. Trust me. You know why? It's a very simple story. The text that you are looking at is long of a certain length, by asking you to summarize that particular text, you are to produce a shorter version. We are at the stage where we are telling ourselves that by producing a shorter version, we must present only the main points. You see why I say you can make it simple for yourself. Let me even add at this point that, of course, subsequently when we see the illustrations, each would come with a question. And my dear student, Listen to me carefully. When it comes to summary writing, the very question that you must respond to can even be a guide. Yes. Surprised? Don't be. And let me explain to you why I say that the very question that you may probably say or see as a challenge could be a guide when it comes to summary writing. And I say this to you because, dear student, every summary question has a specific requirement. Listen carefully. Every summary question has a specific requirement so that if you are able to identify this requirement in the question, your job is done. Because subsequently what you are going to do is to write an answer that would respond specifically to the requirement that you would find in the text or the passage. So you see, when I tell you that the very question that you are to respond to can be a guide, that is what I mean, my dear student. Look at the question carefully. Identify the specific requirement in the question and address just that requirement. When you do this, you are in business. Let's see the first illustration, after which we shall see a sample question and then see a suggested answer. So the first one says that in every school in this country, you are sure to find people or students from all walks of life. You will certainly find the respectful, I'm sure you find them in your school, the disobedient, the smart, the disciplined, the intelligent as well as the academically weak, unfortunately, find them in every school. All these people come together to make the school a special place. A very simple extract that I believe all of us can identify with. And from this comes a sample question. In one sentence, state what makes the school special. In one sentence, state what makes the school special. So dear students, that's our question. And on the screen, you have your script. We are to respond to this question by telling specifically what makes the school or school a special place. Let's go back to the text and see how you apply 
what we've learned so far. Again, remember our requirement is what is it that makes the school special? So let's see the text again. It says that in every school in this country, you are sure to find people or students from all walks of life. You will certainly find the respect for their students. So now we're looking at the point where we say that adjectives, for instance, must be off. The disobedient, that's another adjective. You cut it off. The smart, another adjective, it must go away. The disciplined, as well, must go away. The intelligent goes away. The academically weak, as well, goes away. I'd be a modifier over there. Now, the passage goes on to say that all these people come together to make the school a special place. Now, our question. In one sentence, state what makes school or the school special. My dear students, I'm sure you're getting close to an answer by now. Are you? Or you need a few more seconds? I'm sure you have something. I'm sure you have something. Let's now see if your answer would have a semblance to what we have to share with you. Yes. So our expected answer, or our suggested answer says that the school has people from diverse backgrounds. Or you may choose to say the people has people, the school, sorry, has people with different character traits or with different traits. So you see what we've done over here? All of those adjectives that were used to describe the kind of people that you find in a school, which people all do come together to make the school a special place. All of those adjectives, none was found in our answer. So you are not, for instance, going to say or suggest that the school is a special place because you find intelligent people over there. How about the other kinds of people that you found or saw in the passage? Let that be a guide. Let's quickly see the second extract and then see the question that came with it or comes with it. When Oduma wakes up every morning, what she does to please her parents and younger siblings who usually stay late in bed is to sweep her father's main hall, which doubles as the consulting room where each morning scores of patients report for dental attention. When Udma wakes up every morning, what she does to please her parents and younger siblings who usually stay late in bed is to sweep her father's main hall, which doubles as the consulting room where each morning scores of patients report for dental attention. Now let's see our question. So there you are. In one sentence, state what Uduma does each morning. In one sentence, state what Oduma does each morning. Let's go back to the extract. And then begin to apply the things that we say we should be avoiding in presenting our summary answers. Now, the very first item that you find over there, that Vibia clause, when Oduma wakes up every morning, remember we have said that clauses that are illustrative, they go away. Again, remember that this question has a specific requirement. You know, I told you a while ago that your ability to identify the requirement in the question makes your job very easy. This question is asking us to only say or state what a certain somebody does every morning. So in this regard, your job specifically is to state the activity that the person performs. Beyond this, any other thing that you would add or write would be considered redundant or extraneous. So again, we see the extract and the question. In one sentence, state what Uduma does each morning. Specific question with a specific requirement. What is that activity? I'm sure you have an answer again. Mm-hmm. So let's see, let's see what we have here and see if it's close to what you have. Yes, so our expected answer, very simple. Oduma sweeps. 
or if you wouldn't want to use the noun or the name of the person and you want to use the pronoun. Along the line, we shall talk about the use of the pronoun in presenting summary answers. So instead of Uduma, somebody may say, she sweeps. Now, if you wrote an answer that, for instance, read, Oduma sweeps the father's room every morning, dear student, that answer is not entirely wrong, except to say that you will suffer some penalty, some deduction of marks, because your answer includes something that is not relevant relative to the question that you are responding to. Your question is, state what the person does. The question never asks you to add where the person does what he does, or even the time that the person does what he or she does. So let that be a, another guide. Let's see the next one. Our guest, Mamiekwa and her Nigerian friend arrived rather late, close to midnight. Oduma quickly set about preparing something for them to eat. Moments later, food was ready and I could hear the rattling of cutlery as the two friends began to eat. Before they went to bed, however, they told us about their job in Sunyane. They were working in a pharmacy shop owned by a Lebanese and were given wages that could barely put body and soul together, notwithstanding working for 12 good hours each working day. That's an interesting piece you find there. Let's see the question. In two sentences, one for each, state why the two friends were not happy with their work. In two sentences, one for each, state why the two friends were not happy with their work. A quick look once again, dear students, at the extract. So now we are looking for reasons why the two friends were not happy with their work. Let's go back to the text. Attempt to read the passage again and see if we can glean these reasons. Our guest Mamiekwa and her Nigerian friend arrived rather late, close to midnight. And dear student, at this point, you agree with me that we've not found an answer. Oduma quickly set about preparing something for them to eat. That's another sentence which does not present an answer because you are looking for why they are not happy with their job or work. Bear that in mind. The next line says that moments later, food was ready and I could hear the rattling of cutlery as the two friends began to eat. Again, dear friends, at this point, we are looking for why the two friends were not happy with their work. And thus far, we've not seen anything that would satisfy what we are looking for. So let's go on. Before they went to bed, they told us about their job in Sunyane. So now we're getting to the point where the narration or the conversation about the job and why they are happy or not happy with their job would be presented. They were working in a pharmacy shop owned by a Lebanese and were given wages that could barely put body and soul together, notwithstanding working for 12 good hours each working day. Dear ones, I'm sure now you know where to find the answers. Yes. So now let's see what we have suggested over here and then see if they have any semblance with your attempted answers. So let's see. The first answer says that their salaries were low or meager, or you may choose to say paltry. Now, dear student, remember these are answers that were not directly found in the text. These are answers we've written using our own words. So here, I'm talking about lifting. And subsequently, we shall get there and have a very nice conversation about lifting. So the first answer, once again, 
their salaries were low, meager or paltry. And remember, this answer comes from the narration where the two friends were telling us that their wages could barely put body and soul together. And a wage that can barely put body and soul together can only be low, meager or paltry. And then the other reason they gave for which they were not happy with their work, the text told us that they worked for 12 good hours each working day. This is a summary. So you have to present that in your own way or using your own words. We shall talk about that. But let's see what we have suggested over here. So they were being overworked. That's the first one. Or they worked endlessly. Remember, we are told that they work for 12 hours a day. You may choose to say they work tirelessly or they work all day. I'm sure you had similar answers. That's good. Let's see the next illustration quickly. Let's see the fourth one, last but one. In the classroom, both the teacher and the student are expected to play their respective roles to ensure the attainment of learning objectives. When the teacher, for instance, notices that learners do not understand the lesson, he must restate the main point in clear and simple terms. Alternatively, a revision of the teacher's method of teaching may help if, for instance, he had earlier used the lecture method he may now consider the discussion method. An extra all of us can identify with as teachers and students, and even as parents. All of us have been to school. So our question again, in two sentences, one for each, state what a teacher must do to help learners understand a lesson. Let me show you the extract again for a few seconds, and then you attempt a response or responses, then we see if you'd have any semblance with what we have here in the studio. So in the classroom, both the teacher and the student are expected to play their respective roles to ensure the attainment of learning objectives. When the teacher, for instance, notices that learners do not understand the lesson, he must restate the main point in clear and simple terms. Alternatively, a revision of the teacher's method of teaching may help. If, for instance, he had earlier used the lecture method, he may now consider using the discussion method. So that's your extract once again. Sample question. In two sentences, one for each, state what a teacher must do to help learners understand a lesson. Let's see our suggested answers. And indeed, you cannot have any other answers apart from these two that you find on the screen? Look at them carefully. The first one says, the teacher must state the main points again. Remember, we have said that when the teacher notices that the learners do not understand the lesson, he must restate the main points in clear and simple terms. I'm sure you remember that. You saw that from the extract. And that is what we have fashioned our own way by using our own words. And that's what we have over there. And then the second suggested solution that the teacher may adopt is that the teacher must change his method of teaching. Of course, every good teacher does that. The moment you notice that your students are struggling with the concept that you are introducing to them, the least you can do to help your students is to attempt a change in pedagogy or methodology. And that has always been useful. So yes, our text says that when the teacher notices students don't understand the lesson, the teacher must change his method of teaching. Let's go back to the extract carefully, I mean, and then let me point something to you. Look at it carefully. The last bit, the last bit. When the teacher notices, for instance, notices that learners do not understand the lesson, he must restate the point in clear and simple terms. We've spoken about that one already. Alternatively, a revision of the teacher's method of teaching may help. That is the second point that I want you to pay attention to. Now see the illustration that came. If, for instance, he had earlier used the lecture method, he may now consider the discussion method. Remember we had told you or I had told you when the lesson began that you do not include examples and explanations 
in summary answers. My dear student, relative to this text that you have over here, you cannot, for instance, write that the teacher must use the lecture method or the teacher must use the discussion method. In fact, the text did not even say this. Therefore, these couldn't be answers or can't be answers. They had come to explain the main point. And this is something we spoke about when we were looking at how to summarize, looking at the things that you need to ignore to be able to present good answers. So let that as well be a guide. Finally, let's see the last and final extract. The last one, yes, a very simple one. It is the responsibility of all parents to offer advice to their children from time to time. This parental duty has become more present now than ever in the wake of increasing juvenile crimes in the country, examples of which include breaking into financial institutions, snatching vehicles and mobile phones on the highways, trafficking and indulging in illicit drugs, and only God knows what next. Another very simple one, our question. In one sentence, state the remedy the writer offers for the increasing juvenile crimes in the country. In one sentence, state the remedy the writer offers for the increasing juvenile crimes in the country. Let's see the extract again. Let's see the extract again. It is the responsibility of all parents to offer advice. And my dear students, let me talk vocabulary briefly here. Watch the spelling of advice. And notice that it is the CE type. So this is the noun form that we are looking at. When you write the S, then that is the verb. Most of you confuse some of these words. So in the event that you are writing the, the CE and then you go to write the SE, you are communicating something different. The one you see on the screen is the noun. The one with the SE is the verb. Learn that as well. So now this parental duty, what is that duty? Because that is the answer we are looking for. Parents offering advice to their parents. I mean to their children, I should say. So essentially the question has even been answered. Let's see the question again quickly. Let's see the question. In one sentence, state the remedy the writer offers for the increase in juvenile crimes in the country. And the answer is simple. Let's see. Let's see. Are we there? Do you find it on the screen? And is it close to what you have? Is it? Yes, we are there now. We are there now. So our suggested answer says that parents should advise. Very good. Now watch the advice that we have over here. This time we are talking about the verb form. So you find the SE. You see that, I'm sure. Yes. So it says parents should advise or counsel their children. Again, watch the spelling of counsel. So that you do not write anything that would mean anything different and then eventually you end up not getting the marks that you deserve for yourself so my dear student we've taken a look at five illustrations and attempted to apply everything we've spoken about from the beginning of the lesson what are some of the things that we can eliminate in summary writing to be able to come by good answers. And that is what we applied relative to those illustrations. Next, we shall see the do's and don'ts that I spoke about. In summary writing, what can you do? What can't you do? That's where we are now. What you can do and what you cannot do. The commandment, dear students, the first commandment I share with you is that you must always, for every summary answer that you write, you must always write all answers in complete sentences. Dear student, write all your summary answers in complete sentences. Let me again tell you, that this requirement 
is something that you find in every summary question. I'm sure you know about this already. In school, your revisions, your whatever, you know that when it comes to summary, this first commandment I'm sharing with you is a commandment that you find in every summary question. Every summary question would ask you or demand that you present your answers in four complete sentences. And of course, I'm sure we know what sentences are. That very simply, a sentence is that structure, meaningful in itself, with a subject and a predicate. So you mentioned the predicate, you are looking at the verb that would come together with the subject. We know about this already. Every time you write your summary answer, write a full complete sentence. And remember that the sentence has a subject and a predicate. So for every summary answer that you write, ensure that you have foremost a subject. Usually a noun or a pronoun. Set that in place first. Introduce your verb, which then becomes the start of the predicate. Before you add all the elements that you would want to add, it is very, very important, my dear students. Do not ever write a non-sentence for a summary answer. Indeed, during the final exam or even in school, when you write a summary answer that is correct, which answer does not appear in a full sentence, instead of the full marks, you get half. So when the scheme, for instance, says that your full or correct answer should give you six marks, when you write a correct answer that is not a sentence, you get three. And instead of five, you're going to get two and a half. Finally, before we see the next commandment, still on writing answers in sentences, dear student, you sit in the exam hall, you have written your summary answer, so convinced that your answer is correct, but probably you are not sure if what you have is a sentence. Let me tell you how to test the completeness of your answer. Look, look carefully at the answer that you have and attempt a direct translation to any local language at all. Now, as you do the translation, listen to yourself. When you do the translation and the answer, your supposed answer, is meaningful. Meaningful here meaning the answer is complete. You will feel the completeness in your mind as you do the translation. I hope you are with me. If, if I ask you how do you hope to pass your exam, and you tell me that by downloading the Wolo app, that's your answer. How do you hope to pass your exam? Your answer is by downloading the Wolo app. Very simply, that is not a sentence. If I ask you to translate by downloading the Wolo app into any local language at all, my dear student, you will struggle terribly. In fact, even when you're able to do the translation, you would realize that the translation that you made yourself is not meaningful. That very translation will not be meaningful. If I tell you, for instance, that where the headmaster stays and ask you to translate that into Chi, Gan, Fanti, Hausa, whatever, attempt it and see what would happen. Whereas when I say very simply that I think, translate that also and let me see. Yes, you see what you have over there. That's good. Let's take a quick break at this time, come back, and then we continue. Welcome back, dear students, from the break. Just before we went on that short break, we were looking at the do's and don'ts in summary writing. And of course, the first one we looked at was the need to write all answers in sentences. Let's continue. Of course, along the line, the phone lines will be activated so that we take your questions, suggestions, and whatever that you want to share with us. The first caller, I have a very simple question for the first caller. You call and tell us, some of the things that you can eliminate or do away with 
so that you're able to write a good summary. A very simple question. Just tell us some of the things that you can do away with so that you'll be able to write a very good summary answer. Now let's go on, dear students. So we are looking at the do's and don'ts. Now the second one says that avoid starting answers with words like because, when, if, by, to, after, before, amongst others. Dear students, avoid starting answers, summary answers with these ways. And I beg you, do not go and tell anybody that I've told you don't, not to use these words in your summary answers. Watch the wording carefully. What I'm saying is that do not let any of these words begin your summary answer. Because when you do, you are likely to have a non-sentence for an answer. These items are essentially subordinators. And I'm sure you know your subordinators, your study on grammar, once again. So when you begin answers with these words, you are likely to have a subordinate clause for an answer. And you know a subordinate clause can't ever be a main clause or an independent clause for that matter, for which reason it cannot ever be a sentence. When you begin an answer with when, you get a subordinate adverbial clause. When you begin an answer with with, because, all of those words, you are likely to have subordinate clauses as answers. Remember, however, that our first commandment or principle had told us that we need to write all answers in complete sentences. So learn that for me. Now, even before we see the second one, in the event that you begin to write a summary answer with any of these subordinators, you are likely going to have an otherwise long winding answer. If I ask you, for instance, very simply, how do you hope to pass your exam? Or why are you hopeful of passing your WASI? Then you say, because I have WOLO. That answer is a subordinate clause, and it's not complete. If you want to make that complete, you may want to say that because I have WOLO, I am hopeful of passing my exam. Because I have WOLO, I am hopeful of passing my exam. Now, this is the situation we're looking for precision. So a very simple, straightforward answer to the question, how do you hope to pass your exam? Simply say, I have WOLO. When you begin the answer with because, you are now going to add some elements that would eventually make the thing winding and long. So you see another reason why I tell you not to use these subordinators to begin answers. The next one says that you must try to cut off embellishment and redundant or extraneous material and state only the main point. Of course, that's what summary is about. Always cut off embellishment and redundant extraneous material and state only the main point. Note as well that it is not prudent to include a part of the question in your answer. Except, let me clarify this a bit. Except you are using a useful portion of the question as your subject. Remember we have said that every summary answer must be written in a sentence. Now the sentence needs a subject. A very easy way of doing this is to find a very sensible portion of the question. You may use that as your subject, introduce a verb, and then supply what you have as a response or an answer to that particular question. Subsequently, we shall see how this plays out. Now, commandment number four, almighty lifting. Never lift answers, and you see something in brackets, I will explain. Never lift answers from the text or the passage. Summary does not like lifting, my dear students, and you know. Summary would expect that as much as possible for whatever answer that you write, you use your own words. Dear one, my dear friend, 
when they say you should use your own weight, listen carefully, it does not in any way mean that you cannot use words from the text or the passage. Listen carefully. They are asking you not to lift. Waik has a very beautiful way of describing it. They call it mindless. And you know what they call mindless. Mindless is the instance where you would find one sentence in the text or the passage. And then because you are so convinced that that particular sentence satisfies a particular question, you pick the sentence in its entirety as seen in the text or the passage and present that as your answer, my dear student, you would get a big fat zero. The answer could be correct, but you have lifted, not just lifted, but lifted mindlessly. That's how they call it. So what I say to you now is that do not ever see a sentence in a text, a passage, which sentence you tell yourself that because you know it's appropriate for a particular question, you just go ahead and write that sentence as your answer. You are not going to get any mark for that particular answer that you provide. They say use your own words. It does not mean that you cannot use words from the text or the passage. Sometimes you can even look at a very simple rearrangement of words. Those same words that you find there, rearranged beautifully. The answer that you provide becomes your own. Don't ever lift answers from the text or the passage. It is very much unacceptable. If you are looking, for instance, at a text that is saying that drivers need to do regular maintenance of their vehicles to ensure that their vehicles are always in shape, that's your text. What must drivers do to always ensure that their cars or vehicles are in shape and on the road working? The passage says that regular maintenance will help drivers to do this. In writing your answer, dear student, excuse my language, it would be silly to pick that regular maintenance as your response and present it for assessment or for marking. You get zero. It is an answer that is in the text, but they're asking you to use your own words. So when you find regular maintenance in the text, you can simply say, drivers must maintain their vehicles. Easy, isn't it? Simple, isn't it? And you agree with me. So you see what we've done. You can simply turn a noun into a verb. Or let me rather say, you may look for the verb forms of nominal items. Do that modification and present that as your answer. It is perfect. So the text says that regular maintenance of vehicles would ensure that the vehicles are always in shape. Do not write regular maintenance of vehicles as your answer. Say that drivers must maintain their vehicles often. So we turn regular into often. We turn maintenance into must maintain. And the answer that we are now supplying is our answer. Have you learned something? That's good. Now let's see the next one. Commandment number five says that consciously make judicious use of pronouns to prevent answers that may be potentially ambiguous. Consciously make judicious use of pronouns to prevent answers that may potentially be ambiguous. Dear student, that's our fifth commandment. The use of pronouns in summary writing. Yes, the use of pronouns in summary writing. What are we talking about here? These days you even find in certain books where writers are telling their readers that you don't use pronouns in summary writing. Sometimes you meet students and they even tell you that they have read or they have heard from whatever source that when it comes to summary writing, you do not use 
pronouns in presenting your answers. I hold a different view. Which view is that you can perfectly use pronouns in presenting summary answers, except to say that you must be so careful so that your answers do not end up being ambiguities. Let me explain this. Imagine you are looking at a question that mentions more than one noun. The question mentions more than one noun. So in presenting your answer, instead of picking a noun and making it the subject, you may want to use the pronoun. When that happens, the answer that you write or provide, even if it is correct, you get a zero. And that is because the answer would likely be an ambiguity. Let's see what we have for example. So a very simple question. In one sentence, state why Jennifer punished Eunice. In one sentence, state why Jennifer punished Eunice. You are probably looking at a text or a passage that is telling you about a certain teenage mother somewhere living with a daughter called Eunice or younger sister called Eunice. Something probably might have happened. And so the teenage mother Jennifer decides to punish Eunice, the sister. In one sentence, state why Jennifer punished students. And dear student, this is where I talk about, what I talk about, that where you find that the question mentions more than a noun. Now see what we have over here. First, there is the mention of Jennifer, the first noun, and then there is Eunice. State why Jennifer punished students. That's our question. Now see the suggested answer on the screen. I'm sure you've seen it. Read it. Mm -hmm. Does it sound funny? She was drunk. State why Jennifer punished students. And the answer says she was drunk. So here, simple question. Who was drunk and who punished who? You see what I talk about? The use of the pronoun and what it has done over here. 